And I'm so grateful to the library for letting us use their auditorium for uh, tonight's uh, discussion of the importance of local farms and farmers markets um, for our, uh, the health of our families and the health of our community. Forrest Pritchard is a seventh generation farmer who sells grass-fed meat, eggs, and poultry at several of our area markets. His book, Gaining Ground, the story of farmers markets, local food, and saving the family farm, documents the resurrection of his farm, Smith Meadows, in the uh, Shenandoah Valley, from the brink of collapse to a thriving family-owned business. And our local courthouse farmers market had a role in that. So I'll let Forrest tell you more about that. Please welcome Forrest Pritchard. Um, I am delighted to be here. Um, I want to thank Arlington Public Library for having me here first off, and especially or equally uh, to One More Page Books, which if you don't know where they are, um, they are right near the Falls Church Farmers Market, actually. Um, kind of near the Falls Church, East, East Falls Church Metro, or? Yeah, just uh, right along 66. They're kind of tucked in there. Just look for them sometime and, and come visit them. They've been nothing short of extraordinary in helping me. Um, I wouldn't be here tonight, right here, if it, if it wasn't for them. So uh, thank goodness for small bookstores that are, that are still out there. Yeah, here's to that. I actually have a, I, I think a pretty, funny story about being right upstairs here by the computers. About three years ago, I was coming into the Arlington Farmers Market meeting, and somehow I got here about an hour early. And I mentioned in the book that I love kind of the sanctity and, the, you know, kind of the, uh, the ambiance of working in libraries. So I stopped in here, and I was upstairs, like I said, this is probably three or four years ago now. And I am always that guy who like silences his cell phone. Okay? When I walk into a library or walk into a movie or, or whatever, I silence my cell phone. And I just got, I set my phone on the table. I knew it was on silent. And uh, I went to work on the book and all of a sudden the ringer went off like I dumped like a, you know, a, a plate of silverware inside like a cathedral. You know, it was the noise. And it was also on vibrate so the phone was like skittering, you know, on the table. And, uh, I, I, I reached for it and I kind of like clumsily knocked it and it spun and it just exacerbated the situation. I was utterly flummoxed and when I looked up, the librarian was, you know, standing there <laughs> like this. And I, and I said to her, I said, maybe I said this internally, I can't remember, I was probably just too red-faced. I said, please, I'm, I'm one of you, <laughs> really, I swear, like I'm, I'm, one, I'm, one of, I'm one of you guys. Um, but yeah, she wasn't having any of it. So the way the presentation I'm going to give tonight is um, I did a little, you know, 15-minute slideshow because our farm, like most family farms, is really photogenic. And it's really, it's special in its way, uh, and it's unique. And I wanted to share some pictures with you of our farm. Um, so without further ado, I just want to ask the question, and, and you know, I, I think it's going to be preaching to the choir a little bit here. Like, how could anyway, anybody possibly ask, do, do family farms still matter? But when we think about, you know, you can't turn on the radio right now without hearing that McDonald's is celebrating the 10-year anniversary of the dollar meal. You know, which, think about it. For 10 years, their food has been stuck at a dollar, you know, while inflation and cost of living, all these things have gone up. How is that possible? I don't know. That's not what I'm here to talk about. But... You know, in that context of fast food and Walmart rolling back prices, how is it possible that we could still value family farms? Um, make sure that this goes the right direction. Right. So this is my farm. Um, this is a field of like buttercups and pasture because I'm a grass farmer. This is looking east. That big hill in the background is the Blue Ridge Mountain, and where where we are sitting right now is if you you know take a big jump over that and don't land for about 45 miles, that's where we are right now. So that's looking east. And um, a quick word about what I mean about family farms. When I'm talking about family farms, I'm talking about the farm we all learned about when we learned old, a song Old MacDonald. Okay? Uh, uh, a quack quack here and an oink oink there. 
Okay, and these aren't fables or you know imaginary. Um, this isn't made up nostalgia. This is the quilt work tapestry of our culture, of our of our American heritage for the last hundreds of years. Okay, and for what the way I'm talking about a family farm is uh, a, a farm that remains independent of any um, responsibilities to um, you know contracts with such as with like Tyson's or Purdue or Wampler Longacre, um, they s subsist on their income by growing food and selling it to people. And um, the final thing is that they re remain um, completely independent of any like burgeoning uh, investments, dedication to shareholders, you know, things like that. So this is, you know, when I'm talking about the family farm, I'm a seventh generation family farmer. A young farmer tomorrow could go out and buy her own farm you know, a 22-year-old college graduate, and that could be a family farm. Okay, so just so we got our definition straight. Quick show of hands, how many people in the audience tonight are professional full-time farmers? <laughs> it wasn't meant to draw a laugh. <laughs> Not my intention. I went over that question several times in my head, and I never got laughter out of it. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's none. I can raise, I'll raise my hand. Um, second question then, hopefully we'll get more of a show of hands, how many people grew up on a family farm? All right, just smattering. Maybe what, like around 10%, maybe a little less than 10%? Ah, uh, yeah, right. Last question, how many people's grandparents in here were professional farmers or made their living off of farming? Now we're up to getting close to half, okay? All right, so let's rearrange those questions real quick and give some cultural context about why we might value family farms. If, we, if, I, answer, if I asked that question 50 years ago, um, on the last question, statistically, everybody but like one or two of you would have raised your hand. That's a fact. That's a statistic fact. Okay? Um, if I had asked you, that was your grandparents, um, because they would have been, you know, in the 1880s or something like that. Um, if 50 years ago I asked you if you grew up on a family farm, uh, roughly three out of four of you guys would have raised your hand. That's a statistical fact. And if we just go back a, a little bit further, about 75, 80 years, if I'd asked you if you're professional farmers, uh, one out of every four of you would have raised your hands, okay? And these are all census, census facts and statistics. So answering and asking these questions kind of give us a little bit of a clue, you know, about why we have this nostalgia and this cultural resonance. But we have to ask the question, like, what's in it for us? You know, we live in a world of, of Facebook and, and tweeting and instant gratification and, and, you know, how many likes do we get on our posts? And, um, and if we don't get enough, then we, you know, no, we, no, am I the only one not at the party kind of thing? So what's in it for us? What, what does a small farm have to offer us? Because after all, small farms are, are deeply inconvenient, okay? I guarantee you cannot walk to the local family farm from here, in a, <laughs> not in a pair of work shoes, okay? Slow food is just that. I mean, slow food is slow, okay? It takes me two years to raise a grass-fed steer a year before that to breed the cow and the bull. And if I was starting it from scratch, it would take me a year or two to establish the pasture. Who in here wants to wait five years for a grass-fed hamburger? Okay, I don't, okay? Uh, s family farms are seasonal. There's a reason we don't have local strawberries in December and fresh-picked apples in April, okay? Not locally, anyway. And there's a limited selection. Now we can, every one of us in here, walk down to the Whole Foods from here and we can get some, uh, organic shampoo and uh, you know, uh, eco-friendly kitty litter, um, along with our grass-fed steaks and you know, some organic rhubarb or, or whatever we want. And at my farm, you can only get one of four of those things. Okay? That's just the facts. So like, why, you know, why are we compelled to support family farms? Why, when we're driving down the highway, and this is a picture of our farm right along the road, um, why, when we're driving down the highway, do we feel compelled to look at that and, you know, and have these like mixed emotions, but, you know, I'd hazard to say that they're like largely positive. Uh, why do we want to pull over and take a photograph of that and like breathe the fresh air and like roll down our windows and like go moo hoo hoo, <laughs> right? Why do we do that? Um, and, when we, and when we drive by this, if we ever see this, which we may not because after all there's, there's all barbed wire down here and stuff, uh, why? do we roll up our windows and turn on the air conditioning and say, please God, make it stop, or for the next five miles? 
Okay. I think probably everybody, if you haven't known that you've driven by it, you probably have because that's what happens. Everybody rolls up their windows. We're told, after all, that these, these are brands we can trust. I mean, it says right there, these are brands we can trust. This is, I love the rest, Restaurant Depot is where we get like our pasta boxes and stuff. It's uh, over in uh, Alexandria on like, uh, oh, it's over there off an the exit. But uh, beautiful photo opportunities in there. Uh, <laughs> Like any time, if you see in my blogs, they're always like pulled out of here. It, after all, it tells us it's authentic, okay? It is authentic. It says it right there. And that this beef is superior, right? So we can, tr we can trust this stuff. I mean, uh, this is taken out front. Um, this is a weird Al Yankovic impersonation. I'm sure he's going to be suing for something here directly. But wow, wow cartoon Weird Al Yankovic, these prices are insane in rainbow colors. You know, why, I agree. So why are we shopping at farmer's markets? Why are we supporting local uh, family farms when we could be shopping in this inviting, fre fresh smelling, fluorescently lit, and obviously recently waxed <laughs> um, aisle of food? I mean, that's food, that's, that's food, right? So what's the deal? My instinct is that it has to do with what I'm calling a very neat and tidy, uh, uh, the three T's. OK, I'm going to talk about them really quickly. Transparency, trust, and the last one, truth, which is a, you know, that's a, that's a biggie, OK? And I don't pretend it not to be a biggie. That's why I put it in italics down there. And stay with me for a minute. Like, uh, just uh, trust me that we're going to get to the truth. All right, we'll be, I'll be very transparent about it. Because I was an English major, it says right on my degree that I get to um, make mathematical equations out of words. <laughs> All right, so that's what I've done here. That's a, uh, so transparency, and we add that to trust, and we add that to truth, it equals value. And I put that uh, parenthesis S because value is a word that's that's largely been meant to connote cheapness, okay? Value meals and cheap eats, okay? But if we stick an S on that, okay, it becomes a philosophy, all right? So it works both ways. Why is it a financial value and why is it a philosophical value? Let's start with transparency real quick. When we go out to, let's take my farm for example. When you drive out to my farm, which everyone is welcome to do, just don't all come at once. <laughs> Um, we have no, no trespassing sign at the end of our lane, so please come out. That's why there's children out here. This isn't like a stage photo. Uh, this is our farm day from like two years ago. When you come out to my farm and you s can bring your kids to safely interact with living food, okay, and forgive me, but, you know, these pigs end up as, in sausage and, and pork chops and stuff. Um, I'm not going to convert anybody to, to vegetarianism tonight. When you come out, you have opportunities to... to to view transparency in its purest form. You get to see that, that free ranging is not smoke and mirrors. Okay, it's not something on a pamphlet or, or something that the, the farmer just says behind his table. When you go to that farmer's market and, and you look that farmer in the eye and he says, my pigs are free range, uh, he, they better be free range, okay? And when you come out to our farm, they are. You get to see where the pigs are eating, you get to see that they have no signs of abuse, that they've been treated humanely, okay? When you, go in, when you walk into a Wawa, I've been practicing that line all afternoon. You walk into a Wawa, and you take just you know take a Slim Jim and take it up to the counter and say, um, "Can you tell me like you know how, how this how this cow was raised?" <laughs> I mean, why not? What do you got to lose? Throw, throw it up on YouTube, right? Yeah, that'll get some hits. When you come out to my farm and you you can see what the, what the diet of the cows are eating, uh, you can ask me. Just straightforward slaughter questions, you know, how, are the, how did you transport the animals? Do they have to stand for like, you know, 48 hours on concrete before they're slaughtered? Um, how does your butcher, you know, d dispatch the animals? You can answer those questions or you can go into Costco and, and, and you, th this is what you see in Costco, okay? What do I know about that beef? I know that's meat. I know that's animal protein. At least I think I do. I think that's, an I think that's beef because the next thing is trust. So I'm, tr I'm trusting that that's all meat. And why do I say that? Um, is because these are, these are just like four headlines that have all been in the tw past 12 months. Okay? And like, so I spend a lot, I spend a lot of time driving. 
which gives me the opportunity to think a good bit. And driving, I drive to the butcher, I drive to farmer's markets. And, you know, every, uh, my whole career, and even as, a, even as a kid, I'm listening to the radio, and it's like, you know, a food recall. You know, food recall, you know, they're pulling out strawberries, or they're pulling out tainted beef. And it's like that Who song. It's like, we won't be fooled again. Mm. You know? And I'm like, we won't, it's like, we got it this time. This time it's good. Like, that was so bad, you know, like, people got sick. Uh, a couple people, you know, died, okay? This, this, like, this can't happen anymore, okay? And you go, like, two or three months, and you listen to the radio again, and it's, like, uh, another food recall. And it's, like, you fire up the hood, and, like, okay, okay, that was, like, we missed that one, but, like, we won't be fooled again, <clears throat> right? And you do that, you know, like, 50 or 60 times, and it comes on, and you're, like, we won't be fooled again. Right, you start to you start to like give up a little bit. Um, so you know, pink slime, uh, horse meat, and all the you know, all the hamburgers in Europe. Uh, just the recent GMO patent law being upheld by the Supreme Court, and and 33 food recalls since this first of this month. Okay, since June 1st, there's been 33 food recalls in the United States. Okay, this is public information. Okay, and finally, you stuck with me. We're gonna get to get the truth. And truth to everybody means something else. Okay, whatever truth means to me, to any of you guys in here, it's, all, it's a unique experience. So I'm going to quickly suggest that we're gonna equate truth with balance. And why do I say truth equals balance? Because the way I, the way I process truth, it's this internal mechanism where um, you know, like when you stand up and like you don't fall over. That's the way truth mostly feels. Like you don't, you, like you don't get like out of balance and stuff. We like we know when we're out of balance, right? We've got this internal calibrating mechanism, and I think truth kind of operates that same way, too. Um, and when we see some of these previous information, lack of transparency and a lack of and a violation of trust, um, we begin to question what truth, what truth might mean. So, and this is my boy. So if we're going to equate truth to balance. Here's what I mean by truth and balance, okay? I'm going to give you three quick examples. If, if we're growing uh, 25,000 acres of corn in Montana, and we harvest that corn and we truck it or, or train it all the way down to the, east, the panhandle of Texas to feed cattle that are going to convert it at six pounds of grain to one pound of gain, and then when those animals are finished, we're going to truck them again up to uh, somewhere in Illinois to be processed. And then we're going to take that meat and we're going to send half of it to uh, San Diego and, uh, and half of it to Boston. You know, I start to feel dizzy. You know, I feel like I'm being spun with a blindfold. Or, I mean, I'm, I've been told to hit a pinata that I don't know where it is. Okay? And that's the way I feel about the way our, our, our major food system uh, construct is set up. Another quick example. Um, this one's really easy. The average age of farmers in the country is 60. Where's the balance in that? Where are the young people? Okay. And the final one is in 1980, when you bought a dollar's worth of food, the farmer got 30 cents of that. It's, you know, not too bad. Except in 2013, it's less than 15 cents of every dollar that you spend on food. And in the meantime, you know, look at the graph, the chart of cost of living and inflation that's gone up from there. So that's what I mean by balance. Things, that, things are just out of balance. So why do we love family farms? There's a funny thing about people that I, I think, okay? When you give someone a job that they love to do and that job happens to have meaning, like it's a useful job, and they get like fairly compensated for it, it makes people happy. Like they say like the, the happiness is like the intersection of of occupation and avocation, okay? So you like you do what you you do what you have to do, but you do it you do what you would have been doing anyway, okay? And that's what most farmers dream of. I think most farmers just want to grow good food and like share it with people, okay? And at the end of the day, they have to pay their bills, so they have to make a little bit of a profit or whatever. But when you give someone a job that they love and it's a meaningful job and they get paid for it, they smile, right? They look really happy, okay? 
And to illustrate that point, here are just a few faces at Arlington and Falls Church farmers markets, my peers. Okay, this is on our farm. That's my son and, and, and uh, the Pla Plaxon kids and Dan Michelson and my friend Don at farmers markets. Man, I didn't tell them to like look so happy. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, I'm gonna take your picture. So, so what do we value? Okay, transparency plus trust plus truth equals values. All right, and we hear so much about like, you know, our American values and our core values. Okay, I'm gonna suggest we should start shooting for some balanced values. And these are just like five that I came up with at the top of my head. When you support a family farm, you can know where your food comes from. Food identity, has a, if there's a face to your food, and you, there's an origin to it, okay? You can know if the, not only the, that the animals are treated humanely, but frankly, the, if the soil is treated humanely, which moves us right down to here, not treating our soil like dirt, okay? <laughs> okay, and that includes just sustainable practices of, you know, erosion and, and you know, herbicide use and, and things like that. We can value our views, okay? Think back to that first slide, uh, you know, what we were driving past and the views that we see. And we can actually eat the landscape. Okay, this isn't, this isn't poetry. Yeah, well, kind of. Kind of. <laughs> I don't really expect you to. Well, maybe you can. And finally, again, getting back to that point, because, you know, I don't live on ra rainbows and butterflies. You know, I, I have to make money. So fair farming wages, and why do we want fair farming wages? To incentivize all those 20-year-olds to fill in the generational gap that the 60-year-olds are currently filling who can't fill it forever. So we need financial wages for the next generation of producers. And that's why we maybe pay a little bit more for this food. Okay? So I'm gonna crib Shell Silverstein real quick. This is where the sidewalk ends. Okay, and that is a farm in the background over here. And, and, fam and the family farm begins. And that's me enjoying some grass. Right there. <laughs> um, and this is another view of our farm with the Blue Ridge again. So I figure I'd do a reading now. And then I take lots of questions or any questions. How was that? Was that all right? Yeah. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and do that. So some quick context to this. Um, I guess I'm, am I speaking? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna keep on speaking into here. Um, so I'm gonna read from chapter 21, which is my very first day at Arlington Farmer's Market. And when I say Arlington Farmer's Market, I mean the Courthouse Farmer's Market right down here. Saturday morning, eight to noon. I recognize some faces in here, but I expect to see everyone next Saturday. <laughs> no pressure. Um, so what's happened here is I've tried my local farmers markets in, in Berryville and in Loudoun County, and they've just they've been uh, unmitigated financial disasters. You know, I've literally there's been several times I've literally made fifteen twenty dollars uh, net uh, gross. Okay, it's gross, um, not net. Okay, net would be like negative eight hundred. Um, and Ellen Paul Shuck, which is one of the few names I don't change in here who manages an aspect of Potomac Vegetable Farms, a lot of people probably know Ellen, um, has convinced me a chapter or two earlier to give it one last try and to attend the Arlington Farmer's Market, okay? So this is how it goes, and I've, I've edited it a little bit, but it should take about 10 minutes. The chance meeting with Ellen and Dan at the conference put our farm into motion in ways I never could have envisioned, much less scripted. The farm made it through another long winter and Dad and I showed up at the Arlington Courthouse Farmer's Market early one Saturday in the year 2000 at six o'clock in the morning. I was more than a little nervous. We were assigned a permanent space between a vegetable farmer named Peter Perkins from Hanover, Virginia, and John Hyde, a baker from Hyattsville, Maryland. As we introduced ourselves, I couldn't help feeling like it was the first day at college all over again, meeting the roommates, getting oriented, I try not to appear too eager or uncool. I'm gonna jump a little bit if you're following along. The individual stalls were easily three or four times the size of ours, and they carried the feeling of a storefront unto themselves. Two or three employees helped with sales, restocking, bagging, and answering questions. As I watched them make their final preparations, 
I, joke, I jokingly wondered aloud if we should do some calisthenics in advance of the apparent customer onslaught. Good, ide good idea, Dad replied, hungrily eyeing a cheese and cherry Danish a few feet away. <laughs> you do some toe touches. Get good and limber. I'm going to go meet the baker. <laughs> Don't go far, I said, half in admonishment and half out of nervousness. I'm going to need your help. That's why I'm getting something to eat, he explained without stopping, to keep my strength up. He had hardly stepped out of our stand when I felt a touch on my arm. You new here? A woman's voice asked. I turned and looked down. A small, disheveled woman with long gray hair and thick glasses peered up at me. I hadn't seen her enter the tent, and her arrival startled me. Yeah, I said, trying to hide my surprise. This is our first day. I extended my hand. I'm Forrest. Glenda, she said, taking my hand. Her grip was warm, but rough from hard work. I run Bunny's Bakery. We're a couple of stands down. We sell cupcakes. Nice. How long you been selling here? She sighed, her shoulders lifting and sagging beneath her oversized shirt. Almost since this market started. Next year will be our 20th year here. Wow, so it must be a good market for you then. Our best, she stated. Has to be. Too hard to work otherwise. Without warning, she grasped me firmly by the elbow and pulled me close. Now look, she said, lowering her voice to a confidential tone. Our faces were only inches apart, and I could smell coffee and cinnamon buns on her breath. <laughs> you look like a nice guy. I can tell that right away. But listen, I've seen a lot of nice people over the years. Her grip on my arm tightened. I want to tell you something that I wish someone had told me a long time ago. I was utterly flummoxed by this unexpected intensity. OK. She pulled me a centimeter closer, holding steady eye contact from behind her smudged opaque glasses. What I'm going to tell you, don't you ever forget. It's going to make or break your whole career. I, I, I promise? Good. Now listen. She glanced from side to side. Don't ever, don't you ever wholesale your stuff. I don't care if you're selling emus or artichokes. Don't wholesale. Don't let anyone talk you into it. Don't let anyone tell you it's a good idea. Retail, retail, everything retail. I opened my mouth to speak, but she cut me off with a single syllable, MEP. <laughs> she raised a gnarled index finger towards my lips. No talking, listening. <laughs> she cleared her throat with a phlegmy rattle and swallowed decisively. The only exception, the only exception, she repeated, and squeezed my elbow to the point of pain, is if you've retailed everything, every last thing, and you can still produce more. She paused, inhaling for a final sortie. But before you do that, try to retail it. It's the only way to make it in this business. With that, she released her grip. Circulation slowly returned to my arm. <laughs> Thanks, I managed, thoroughly perplexed. I'll be sure to remember. Remember, she agreed. Do it for yourself. If you're ever going to make it, someday you'll look back and remember this conversation. Behind me, I heard the heavy clump of my father's boots and turned. I got you a bear claw, he boomed, proffering a sticky baked good wrapped in a piece of tissue paper. They didn't even charge me anything. The man just said, welcome to market, and handed it to me. Dad smiled dreamily, talking around a piece of pastry. I think I'm going to like it here. <laughs> I took the offering distractedly, the woman's voice still haunting my ears. Dad, this is Glinda. She runs bunnies. She was no longer there. I searched for her, but she had disappeared entirely. It was only after several moments that I managed to spot her, somehow already back at her own stand, methodically organizing cupcakes. That's her over there. How did she move so fast? Anyway, she just came over a minute ago, and I wanted to introduce you. My dad, at first disinterested, suddenly noticed the brightly colored cupcakes. Oh, by all means, he agreed, <laughs> his face lighting up at the prospect of a second helping of snacks. But it's probably better if I just introduce myself. You stay here and do some more jumping jacks. I sighed. When it came to food, 
Somewhere along the way, we had reversed father-son roles. More and more, I felt like the protective parent, trying my best to influence his eating habits in positive, healthy ways. About another page and a half. But I didn't have time to think about that now. As he made his way across the street, I noticed that the market was already filling with customers. Even though the opening bell hadn't yet rung, shoppers were lining up in advance, and a man ducked into our tent. Your sign says you sell free-range eggs? Yes, sir, free-range eggs from our farm. Sounds good. How much? We had decided earlier that season to raise our prices to account for the greater distance in travel and fuel. That and the small fact that we had done nothing but lost money on chickens ever since we'd been raising them. Three dollars a dozen, I said, wincing internally, self-conscious that it was the highest price for eggs to ever come out of my mouth. Sounds good, the man said, reaching for his wallet. I'll take two dozen. Two dozen? I said to myself. Why in the world would someone need two dozen eggs? <laughs> I repeated this request just to make sure. Yes, two dozen. And your beef is totally free range, raised on pasture? Absolutely. Uh, all grass, no grain at all, and we don't use any chemical fertilizers or antibiotics? Or Great. I'll take two pounds of ground as well. Why, of course, I reasoned. Anyone who needs two dozen eggs clearly needs two pounds of ground beef as well. <laughs> Maybe he just went around buying two of everything. <laughs> and he said, tapping his chin, studying our list, a chicken. Say four pounds? I nearly fainted right on the spot. In less than 30 seconds, it was the biggest single order I'd ever gotten at a market. I climbed onto the back of the truck, retrieved the ground beef and chicken, and weighed the meat on the scales. That'll be $24.50. In the distance, I heard the opening bell ring. And in 60 seconds, I had already made more money than at, than at my entire first market back at home. As novel as this experience was, though, I didn't have time to enjoy it. Two more customers entered the stand than a third. For the first time in my career, I had a line. My father bustled in halfway through my fourth sale, a pair of sirloin steaks and a package of sweet Italian sausage. Sorry, he whispered loudly as I bent over the freezer. I didn't expect you to already be this busy. I found the steaks and the sausage and pulled my head out of the freezer. I didn't expect it either, but Dad, I nearly dropped the meat. What? You've got pink frosting in your beard. <laughs> Come on, man. He turned his head from the line of customers, abashedly licking at the corners of his mouth. Is it gone now, he asked in a small voice. Exasperated, I made him march to the side view mirror for self-inspection. When he returned, frostingless, I had already worked my way to the end of the line. I should go away more often, he quipped. As soon as I leave the stand, you get a crowd. Don't go away too quickly, I said. I've got a feeling today's going to be pretty steady. And it was. Although we came nowhere close to our dream of selling out of everything, we ended the day making more money than we had ever made at a single market before, nearly $500. It was enough to pay for our gas and our time, while sparking our optimism that we could make enough in the future to pay some of our bills back at the farm. My father, counting the stack of $20 bills we had accumulated, was so happy he bought an entire box of cookies from the baker next door. <laughs> What, he asked, catching my disapproving look. I got them to celebrate. Plus, they're your favorite, oatmeal raisin. Dad, I was happy too, but my father's eating habits were simply out of control. <laughs> You're on medication now. You can't be going around eating boxes of cookies. Crestfallen, he opened the lid in spite of my chastisement. Well, here's a cookie for you anyway. <laughs> Congratulations on your big day. Our big day, I corrected. And don't give me that hangdog look. You know I'm just trying to take care of you. He took no comfort in the brand of care that I was offering. By the time I pulled onto Interstate 66, a mile away, I noticed his hand sneaking into the box. Oh, for Pete's sake, just eat a doggone cookie, will you? I thought you'd never offer, he said with transparent glee. Another minute or two, and I would have starved to death. I'd narrowed my eyes in disapproval. By the time we got home, 
He had eaten half a dozen. Uh, what you don't see at the farmer's market, <laughs> behind the scenes look. So that's my program for the evening. It's frankly all I prepared. Um, so I'm happy to take questions. I'm happy to uh, start questions. I think that they requested if we do have any questions that they be microphones. Okay. Got someone in the back and someone in the front. Hi, I'm Emma. Um, I know that uh, you are friends with Joel Salatin, yeah. and um, I read his book, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. That's right. um, maybe you could comment a little bit on some of the most um, frustrating um, challenges you've had legally as a farmer. Great question. Um, yeah, so like every farmer, this is like something you guys probably don't know. Every farmer's market that I attend, and we attend eight, uh, seven in, in th around this area and one at home, they're all different, okay? There's very few like umbrella groups or, cr you know, uh, they're not businesses, they're all they're all unique. The one here is, is sponsored, still, where's Kimberly Hahn, is she still in here? There, where? Okay, well she was here, it's not. Oh, there she is. Um, you know, uh, that's, that's um, so the you know, Arlington County government has a hand in this one. Tacoma Park is one of the few that's like strictly run by independent farmers. In DC, Fresh Farm and DuPont Circle, for example. So that's my long winded way of saying, like, I have to deal with different jurisdictions, different health departments. And um, Alexandria has been no notoriously tough on me. They, one of the most frustrating things with Alexandria is um, they've just been, and please forgive me if there's any Alexandria health inspectors there. <laughs> really, my best friend is a health inspector. That's true, actually. He gives me some good, good advice on stuff, but. Uh, of mine from 4-H. Um, Alexandria went out of their way to like write me up every, th every time something was supposed to be 41 degrees and it was 42 degrees that they made me bring this refrigerator that's, that was literally the size of this podium right here that I would lift off the back of my truck and set, if anybody shopped at Del Rey, you would have seen this thing. And I then set up a generator, which I have to like fill up with gas that if, if, you, if you squeeze the handle not right, this gas goes just spurting out of it. Okay, and then the whole time during market, we get the pleasant odor of, of you know, a gallon of gasoline to hold something that was at 42 degrees down to 41 degrees, and that's fr that's frustrating. I mean, I like that does that's like not a common sense kind of thing. So you get on the phone with them, and they say, "Well, sir, it's not at 41." It's, you know, so um, but uh, for the most part, like we've got a whole spectrum of inspections. We're federally inspected, we're state inspected, and we're county inspected. Okay, everyone's tax dollars at work, um, and that's fine. Um, that's good. I mean, I think we should have, you know, uh, up in Sinclair. I think was wrote the jungle. Is it up in Sinclair? Yeah, up in Sinclair. I was do the Sinclair Lewis switcher, but um, he wrote the jungle for a reason, you know, because stuff had been nasty, and as you see in the slideshow, things continue to remain nasty, and we need accountability and stuff. But you know, when you shop with your family farmer, and you get to personally speak with them, then you get to answer. You get to answer any questions that you might have about their food production. So as a customer, like you can feel safe and confident and you don't need some accreditation body telling you that it's off by a half degree. You're like, it's cool, pun intended, right? Hi, um, I missed the very beginning of the talk, so if you've already answered this question, I apologize for taking up time, no but worries. you talked about getting the younger generation involved in farming by targeting the farming, the fair wages. But what about the education education system to b make them aware of it? I grew up on a large cattle farm and um, there wasn't much, I wouldn't have learned about it if I hadn't lived on it, basically. Right. And so do you have kids or uh, student groups coming out to your farm to learn? Do you have connections with the um, local public school systems or the private school systems? How are you? Mm -hmm. How do you vision, or what's your vision for that? Right, thanks for asking. Um, the, the most succinct answer I can give is like, a, you know, we, we offer an apprenticeship on our farm, okay? So every year we hire two apprentices and they are there for a full year and when they leave, you know, it's like, it's, you know, they, I've been told by them it's like a master's program because some of my um, apprentices ha have gone through the master's programs. They're really, um, really thoughtful and educated folks and, uh, you know, 
as someone who goes out here and says, like, hey, we need more family farmer, we need more family farmers, then you know, I better be doing something. Like talk is cheap. So I better be putting uh, your guys' money where my mouth is. You know what I mean? Where you're buying stuff from me. So um, so for our in our way, uh, doing the apprenticeship is a great hands-on way to do that. Writing this book was a bit of an attempt to bridge that divide and inspire like a new generation of family farmers, of far, uh, you know, farmers that want to be small farmers. Uh, and I mean, I think 2013, there's been no better time. There's just huge amounts of resources out there. There's no shortage of how-to books, uh, internet resources. There's this great new site called On Pasture, uh, which just came out like two or three months ago that's been tremendously you know, uh, nuts and bolts about how to uh, do some of these farming practices. Um, you know, when I was coming through, the internet really didn't exist. I'm only 39, okay? But when I was 21, the internet might as well. It was like, it was like three sites. It's like three sites on the internet. I go to ESPN, it would take like a half an hour to find like the baseball score. <laughs> like, who's got time for that? Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> well, well played. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think 2013, better than ever. But still, keep in mind, like, only 3% of, of all our food is like the kind of food that I'm talking about. It's coming like directly marketed local uh, from you know, a farmer representing it. 97% of our food is still, again, at the beginning of the talk, it's like how do we participate in the food of like anonymous, uh, culture of anonymous agriculture. Okay, 97% of that is still, that's not to say it's bad, I'm just saying it's out of balance. Okay, so we're gonna find balance by people seeking balance. Hey, my friend. Um, just, I was just curious because I've tried to find some figures on, you know, Pam has, uh, Pam did the article in Flavor about the new generation of Virginia farmers, you right. included, and there were like a pretty good sized group of people under 40. Right. Um, have you seen in your circles like more evidence of younger, or is that Virginia thing really sort of a, a unique? I think it's, con I think it's contagious. I think positive peer pressure is like always contagious. No matter what it is, you know, like when, I don't know. Like I don't get out much, frankly. Okay? <laughs> you know, I mean, like I mean, seriously. I mean, I, when farming and writing are both very isolating activities, right? So, um, I get to participate in some things like craft. Uh, like two days ago, I was at Red Wiggler Farm over near like a, is it Gaithersburg or Damascus? I think is where it is. Um, and there's like, uh, I showed up late, and there were still like 50 or 60 people there and they were all like younger than me. I'm not that old, you know. So, um, and a bunch of people left already. So, uh, Maryland does not a nation make, uh, but that's, that's a pretty good, that's pretty good for Monday afternoon. Hi, can you um, describe if you have any experience with the Chesapeake Alliance for Sustainable Agriculture or talk about food hubs generally? Um, that's CASA, yeah. Right, that's the acronym. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I do. I spoke there in January. Um, I gave a pretty well-received talk called uh, multi Multi-Species Grazing, um, which people seem to appreciate. Uh, then w when you ask if anybody's a professional farmer in there, everybody, ra everybody raises their hand. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, answer, the short answer is yes. Um, what's my experience with them? Uh, and it, like PASA, uh, for example, is one right nearby, uh, Pennsylvania Alliance, and there's MAFCA, Maine Organic Farmers and Growers Association. And all these things are just incredibly useful tools because they're allies. They make us feel like we're not alone. You know, it's so easy to uh, feel isolated or feel like we don't have uh, allies or collaboration in this. And it's just crucial that every once in a while we get together. And I mentioned in the book, there's two conferences. It's like chapter five, like the second time I meet Salatin, I sit next to Bob Evans of all people. Bob Evans. Bob Evans at the restaurants, okay, was sitting right next to me, and he, and I went back to, like, fact check this. I was like, I, I must have that wrong, you know, 1997. Um, but yeah, he was a huge proponent of grass-fed agriculture and, and was very uh, a precursor to everything that's happening right now. He's just ahead of his time. So yeah, these things are uh, va valuable resources. Ask, what size is your farm? How many acres is the right. farm? Um, 
Well, that's an that's a interesting question. Tech, currently right now it's 500 acres, okay, all pasture, uh, partially wooded. So you can see from a lot of pictures, like all these old sycamore trees. When I was growing up on my grandfather's farm, it was over 2,000 acres. It's spread from Virginia, mostly into West Virginia, Jefferson County near Charlestown. And uh, when he passed away, like many farms do, they get handed down. Um, but most of the farm is still in our family. The part that we inherited was actually about 350 acres, and we were able to buy back some of it that was going to go into development. And that is directly from your guys, uh, uh, shopping at farmer's market. No, no, no kidding. OK, we had to borrow some of that. Yeah. Um, if you, if you, you know, people, people got to live somewhere, OK? Uh, and I understand that. But we also got to grow some food, OK? And it's, it's much harder to grow food when somebody's like mowing their eight-acre lawn. Like, seriously. You come out to where I live, people have like five, six-acre lawns. Uh, so my point of that is, you know, uh, our farm is, we, we invest in, in the money that people entrust to us. Um, you will not see Facebook pictures of me in Vegas. Will not happen. <laughs> Won't happen. Just telling you. Yeah, well. There's a farmer's market there. Is there? <laughs> Holy smoke. I check my schedule. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, Forrest, I was just wondering, um, why do you think the markets out in Loudoun and in the country weren't doing well? And, and are they doing any better now? Great question. Uh, so when I'm writing about a lot of these markets, it's 1997, 1998, and uh, they were not doing well. And I, po I postulate a couple reasons why they might have not been doing well in the book. And I think a lot of that is emerging, again, like the positive peer pressure, you know, keeping up with the Joneses to a certain degree. Um, but I think the reason that the city markets are so successful is because there's just, uh, even though you might not know your, might not know your neighbor here, um, per se, like, there's just like a cultural relationship between cities and, and farms. And this goes back thousands and thousands of years, okay? Uh, food was brought in to the city dwellers and they appreciate it. It's like, it's like this banquet of, of freshness and uh, you know, it was like a celebration every week. Um, and they go through and they pick through the fresh stuff and then, you know, there's, there's a hieroglyphics of like someone like picking organic kale. <laughs> I'm improvising here. Uh, but what is new is the suburbs. Okay, what's the deal with the suburbs? Like where did they come from? Um, and I have this feeling when I used to sell, like I sold in Cascades, which is like out near like the other side of Tyson's Corner and a couple other places in there. It just felt like there was like basically three places where people moved, okay? They lived in their, there's a house and there was a car and then there was like a, a store, okay? And it felt like that's where they moved. Like that's their three, that's like their work triangle, okay? And I mean, I'm not trying to be a jerk or anything, but that's just like how I observed it. I didn't feel like, and we were selling like on the edge of like some big parking lot on the edge of like a Home Depot or something. There was just, there was nothing there to have like any sense of connection or any like spirit of like, you know, so, uh, like a social gathering. Uh, so yeah, I love markets like downtown uh, or Arlington Courthouse. I love Tacoma, Tacoma Park is a beautiful farmer's market. Downtown Delray, it's all driven by foot traffic. Okay, Delray has to be because the parking lot is like the size of this room right here where we set up. Uh, so that's my guess on that. I was reading in your book about the Bob Evans experience. Right. And I think you said something like the hardest thing about starting is actually starting. Well, that was in the same chapter. That was actually somebody else, but that's fine. Um, but what I was actually wondering, if you were to be asked that question right now, what, for the younger generation of farmers who, like me, I just graduated from college and I'm interested in going down that path, what advice would you have about starting? Uh, the best, best advice I can give you is just ident identify your market first. Uh, figure out, like if, if you've already checked in with yourself and like the farming dream appeals to you and like it resonates, then that's, that's like all systems go. Okay, that's good. You got that on your side. And that's, you know, you're right out of college. Um, you're going to be able to have time to make mistakes. You're going to have time to like twist your ankle a couple times and drop like potatoes on your feet and stuff and get injured is my point and be able to recuperate and do, and do like, you know, a 16 hour day and, and sleep it off the next day. Okay, which I'm increasingly unable to do. Um, I'm strong like a gorilla. Uh, 
So like, yeah, identify your market is the first thing. There's like so many opportunities out there. Um, there is more demand for this food right now than there are producers. I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced of that. So the world is your oyster, particularly if you want to get into aquaculture and raise oysters. Okay, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> but um, but um, no, I mean, yeah, the opportunities are tremendous. So um, you know, just just stack, try and stack, do your best to stack the deck in your favor. So like right out of the gate, you'll be cash flow positive. Like nothing is as discouraging as like all the, all these people who told you so. Like I told you you weren't going to make it go at farming when they're when they're right. That sucks. Like we want to prove them wrong. You know, so like being your first year, like, hey man, I didn't even like I not only broke even, like I made like you know, five thousand bucks this year. I'm gonna put that back into the farm, because like I'm growing my own food. I'm meeting great people that I'm bartering with food. I don't have to you know drive everywhere to be entertained. Farming is entertaining. So like, you know, my over my overhead is very low on entertainment and expenses. You know, put that right back into the farm. I remember as a child, as soon as you could walk and talk, you had a chore to do. Right. I understand the current laws say you can't work on a farm until you're 18, until you're paid minimum wages. Okay. What's the future, therefore, of family farms? Right. That's a great question. Um, I did not know about that. Um, like, you have to be 18. <laughs> <laughs> Let me call my mom real quick. Um, yeah, so like in, in, my, in, in my situation, um, I was never forced, uh, it was never mandatory that I do chores. It, uh, a childhood was very, uh, you know, those, the, house, the halcyon days of, of, of youth were, were, were like respected, okay? And um, I really appreciate that, looking back on it. For me, that made my decision to become a farmer, like just, I was more, much more motivated. By the time I was like 14, 15 years old, like I wanted to keep up with the men. And that's where I talk in chapter two, like I almost flip a tractor on my head kind of thing. But part of that was because I'd gotten the opportunity to like be a kid. Um, and I wasn't forced to be like in the mundane grind of like, okay, now it's like it's after school and you got to go like shuck corn for two hours. Like they never, nobody ever told me to do that. Um, and when it was time, when it was appropriate to do that, I just did it. Okay. It's like, it's one of those things like makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck, like thinking back on it. Because I was in college and like I was getting a you know, college degree and I was torn because I wanted to take over the farm. Like the stewardship was calling to me. Like if, if I didn't take this over, like what was gonna happen? Like I wasn't like oblivious enough not to like have some sense of, of what was happening. Um, so yeah, I mean for me it didn't have to be like I was in the routine of like learning everything. There's plenty, this is like I was telling her, there's like plenty of time to learn all this stuff and whoever was back there about, um, you know, all these resources that are out there. Like, we've got plenty of time. Um, yeah, and for my own son, he's eight years old now. And um, I think I mentioned in the book, like nothing breaks your heart so cleanly as when he says, uh, you know, I wanna be a farmer like my dad. That's amazing. But uh, he doesn't have a chore routine either though. <laughs> Take it easy on him. Forrest, I think we can take one last question. Sure. Well, somebody pick. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards, too. Hi, Forrest. Hey, Cheryl. <laughs> Cheryl's um, a friend of mine from college. Your, your book is fantastic, and I, I thank you for telling your story because it's amazing. Um, and I'm wondering if you could help me through a dilemma that I've actually been having personally. Okay. So... <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I heard what you were saying about, you know, the inspectors coming through in your farm and, you know, how, well, why do we really need that as someone who um, buys at a farmer's market? You can talk to the farmer and you can understand um, what their practices are and that's great. But something I've actually always wondered, and I do shop at farmer's markets almost every week, right. is I love the fact, well, I love the idea of supporting locally grown food. I honestly don't really know the practices of most of our farmers, and I, for some reason I found that they tend not to advertise it. Okay. Um, and, you know, to have that conversation with the farmer, like, you know, <laughs> well, there's long lines, and so you'd have to wait in line, and then you'd have to say, well, you know, do you use pesticides on your strawberries? And then, oh, if they say yes, well, then do I have to decide I'm not going to buy those strawberries? And, and, you know, sometimes it's just easier to go to the safe way, you go to the organic sure. produce, and, you know. So I guess my question for you is, um, 
what do you find, I know you can't speak for every farmer, but what do you find um, of the farmers that you know from the um, farmers markets, do their practices tend to be more sustainable like yours or a little more conventional? And how do you think the best way to approach that conversation is? Um, so I'll take that as a two-part question. Okay, so like, so like most <laughs> of, uh, the most farmers at the farmers market like have sustainable practices? I would say definitely yes, and like the proof's in the pudding there because if they show up every year, then that's like, that's not only like economically sustainable, but it's putting out a product that people are, uh, are finding desirable that, they're, that they want. Okay, so, you know, I, th I think it's safe to presume that enough people have pulled that farmer aside and asked them the questions or who have done like research that they find this product, you know, to be worth purchasing and selling out and then that perpetuates the financial cycle for the farmer to go back and fire it up again the following year. And I find that to be true with, with most of my peers. I would say they definitely lean towards some form of uh, organic hybridization of the word, you know, like uncertified organic or eco-organic or beyond organic or something. Because we're, as a producer, we're all like really irritated to like have to pay like several hundred dollars to have, to, like wait on somebody to show up to like, be like, okay, you know, check this off, check, yes, 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 I did that. And then we send it in and, and uh, have to fill out all these records and things like that. We just, we, you know, we don't, we just, I've never had time for that. Um, and that's why I've got this communication uh, right across the table people. But I mean, to answer your question, like, I wrote this blog called, like, Four Questions You Should Never Ask at Farmer's Market, and I wrote, like, <laughs> for me, <laughs> I wrote, like, really good-naturedly, like, and tone is, like, so hard to pull off, like, in, in anything. And, like, 95% of people really loved it and thought it was really funny, and they got it, and, like, 5% of people were just, like, like, how dare you even suggest that you can't ask questions? And I, I go out of my way in, in the beginning and end to say, like, Please ask any, but like if there's any four you want to leave at home, like leave these at home. <laughs> you know, like big asterisks everywhere, and caveats, but um, <laughs> it's meant to entertain. But um, yeah, I mean the trick is, is if farmers are showing up at farmers markets, they operate under assumption that they should be asked anything and everything. And my word, have I been asked some stuff over the years. <laughs> it's book, book two. <laughs> Thank you for it. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, thank you.